Hello everyone, welcome to the Kevin Lee Social. Thank you for tuning in. What initially began as an eight-part series interviewing entrepreneurs to share and inspire how they have successfully pivoted during COVID-19, I have decided not only to continue this series, but also to expand on the scope to understand and learn about people's craft, philosophy, the challenges they face in the industry, and their favorite failures that have helped shape them to become who they are today. By going deeper and understanding different thought leaders, businesses, and industries, the idea is to help cross-pollinate ideas applicable in your life and inspire action in this new norm we live in. I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. Today, we have Quinn Slocum. Quinn has built up multiple Instagram accounts with over 4 million followers. One of his biggest pages is Best Celebrations with 2.8 million followers. He created the page because he was inspired by Odell Beckham Jr's best catch of 2014 when the New York Giants played the Dallas Cowboys. That explosion of viral content inspired him to create an account around this concept which perfected his eye for trends. Quinn Slocum taught himself how to create and build a brand all on his own through trial and error and now has mastered the ways to build a following that stays loyal. He's a business-minded prodigy that also knows how to create content that goes viral. Everyone, please help me welcome Quinn. Hey Quinn, how you doing my friend? Life is good, got my mustache so I'm feeling even better. <laughs> <laughs> it looks good on you, it looks good. <laughs> Man, thanks for jumping on, I really appreciate the time. I've been looking forward to this after Danielle Sabrina recommended you. I thought, man, let's definitely connect and I'm excited to see what unfolds. I wanted to check in first and see if you could please share with us a bit about your story from your upbringing to building Best Celebrations Media News Company. Yeah, when I was 13, I started editing lacrosse videos on Vine. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Basically, what, I, what happened is I was just like any average consumer. I would edit, I would browse like Vine videos, and I would see content. And then I started getting engaged with, oh, there's actually people who are creating communities around this. So what happened is I was playing soccer at the time, and I saw a Pele fan page, and I got super intrigued i was like oh i was like i reached out to him and was like do you offer paid pro- promotion posts like i was like 13 like already starting to like get intrigued by like, oh how do you get more shares and stuff and uh, i reached out to this guy he was, yeah it's two dollars for a revine and so basically what happened is i just begged for my mom's credit card and started editing my own videos from my phone and that led to next year I'm getting a hand-me-down computer for my brother getting a MacBook editing on iMovie that moved to Final Cut Pro then I'm editing lacrosse videos at a full scale and engaging with like other lacrosse pages and I built my first ever like social media page that was notable and gave me a name and yeah it it was called Quinn HD Vids 33,000 followers And what happened and basically what made my big jump from Vine to Instagram is because I was like so reputable in the video editing space for sports videos. Another guy, Jason Proct, he has a page called Sports Vines now, but he had just bought into the Instagram space and he was looking for someone to edit his videos. And basically we came to an agreement that, and it started as him just rewinding my stuff. And um, later on, I was like, oh, maybe I should just jump into the Instagram space and uh, do my exchanges through Instagram. So what happened is that I would edit his videos. It was like a 500,000 follower page two to three times per day. And so I would edit two to three videos per day for him in exchange for shout outs. And so basically what happened is I grew my own Instagram for free in like quotation marks. And he would just give me what we call overnight shout outs. So it's nine hours basically while you sleep. And yeah, so that led to my first Instagram. Wasn't best celebrations just yet, but it was athlete cribs. And basically all I did is I would would search up like LeBron James house. And I was like, it it didn't even have to be like in my head. I was like, if I just find a big mansion after typing in the Google search bar, LeBron James house, and it doesn't have to be LeBron James house. All I had to do was be like, oh, I searched on Google. A 14 year old me. I'm like, I searched on Google. And it came up, so it has to be. So I'd pop it on some some white, like some text over a picture. And that became my first like actual Instagram venture. And basically what happened is it was like the same concept. I noticed that basically Revine for Revine is what we call it in Vine. And so it's like share for share. And what 
people call it now is like shout out for shout out, which is a term that we can get into more, but what happened is the same concepts and I would do shout out for shout out on athlete cribs and that grew to 60,000. And then I just, once I noticed that there, like best celebrations was a solid theme to break off of and start another page, I just did shout out for shout out using athlete cribs as 60,000 follower page. And then I put it all towards best celebrations. So I was doing like zero damage to this new page and just like mega juggernaut of a thing. And yeah. And, and it kind yeah, of actually it was- before we, before we continue on, if, if you don't mind me interrupting, Quinn, if we can just quickly go into just for the uh, audience so they can know what shout outs for shout outs is. So this is a quick explanation. That's all. Yeah. What happens is when you have say, Kevin, you have 100,000 followers, I have 100,000 followers, and we want to use our audiences to help each other. And so what happens is you use your audience, I use my audience, we just talk about each other. And so you'd be like, hey, go check out my friend Kevin. He has awesome advice and great podcasts. And you'd be like, oh, go check out Quinn. He's master of social media, whatever, whatever. Yeah. You tell the person, you basically tell the other person what to say about you. Yeah. And, uh, or if you want to do it like free ball it, it's, you can do it that way too. But yeah, it's just exchange of exposure for exchange of exposure. And gotcha. so what would happen is like athlete cribs. It's funny because some of the guys I grew up with now, like Dunk, they were, everyone was named differently back in the day. Like I think it was like Dunk Social, but Dunk Social or whatever, he would have 60,000 followers and then athlete cribs had 60,000 and then you would leave it up overnight. And then the next thing, when you wake up, you just gain 2000 followers. And yeah, it was like way easier back in the day too. Those are real numbers. Like you could just be like waking up be like, Whoa, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, best celebrations. When I, when I started actually putting growth into it, it got 50,000 followers its first week. And that's wow. how I knew it was something to hold on to. And funny little like sidetrack to that. My mom, she's uh, she spoke for Tony Robbins and traveled around the world while I was growing up. And she was like never home. And so what she did is she gave us all a debit card and she would put $50 a week. And that was like, basically, okay, take care of yourself while I'm on the road. And yeah. I would yeah. never use my money for um, food or anything like that. Like I would <laughs> buy frozen taquitos and I would just buy shout outs. Like I would buy shout outs from pages that are one that's notable now. It's House of Highlights. And so I buy shout outs who omar who owned it at the time and he would sell like a 200 hundred dollar package for three accounts and i was like just saving up my money to buy this package because it would grow me like twenty thousand. i'm like boom it'd be like another spike um yeah. so i use that money and so on any money that i made with the account would just go like right back into <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess i let me give you a background of my upbringing in social media and there's a lot of little pieces in there that that make up that story and a lot mm. of cool people met along the way to add to that. But yeah, that's kind of the gist of it. And quickly, for example, when you were setting up for a $200 shout out, what did that $200 entail for a shout out, for example? Just basically, I would, it was a celebration, like what, what it looked like on my side, like what I would send there. It was just yeah. a celebration video, like a 15, 30 second celebration video. And then a caption that said, for the best celebrations daily, follow at best celebrations. And then it would repeat like six times. And then he would just post on all of the stuff. And um, I would cross my fingers hoping that it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I see. But I can't just get out another two in the books like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And to understand the story a little bit more, when do you think it was a pivotal point in your personal story uh, when did it all click for you or when do you think it shifted and just everything changed for you that's that's a good question because i think me five years ago would have said something completely different and that might have been me being like giving my first nike ad or something that's what i probably would have said um, five years ago but mm. now it's is when I found out how to disconnect from everything and that's where my photography comes into play it's just for me the changing moment and so what happened is basically I had a like a hard like heartbreak for the most part and that's when it kind of forced me to take a step back and that's where I 
actually figured out how creative I was outside of the curation process. So I've been a curator since 2013, maybe even earlier if we count some like stuff before that. But I was always on the hunt for viral content and I never actually got to step in the space of realizing how tough I was and the things I could see from just a creative perspective. And so I think once I learned how like connected I am with nature and getting out and skiing and that like mountain biking and stuff like that and taking photos going to Greenland going to Iceland going to like all these rad places that's when I really I found out how to show up better for the people on social media like these fan bases that we build rather than just doing it for uh, to impress other people if that makes sense so I think like before I was doing it to my motivation came from oh I want people to like me. I want people to like me. But the shift was when I figured out that I'm doing this. So I, first, I can like myself and I can be happy with myself. And then I can show up better for other people. Because I think, yeah, I saw this, from this book I was reading. It said, we work so hard to become someone or to become people we don't even like. And that really stuck with me. And yeah, I guess that might answer your question. I want to say enlightened perspective of it, but mm. that's how I feel sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a very mature perspective. Like it's come out of your own personal journey. And yeah, I think it's a great perspective or a great reflection that you've had to, to reflect on. Like you come up with two different answers. You said five years ago, you would have answered differently versus now, which is amazing. Yeah. And I'd like to rewind a little bit and I'll probably jump back and forth a little bit and it's weird, but I always roll with it. There's no rules. Um, <laughs> what was it like having an influencer status at such a young age? Because you said you started all when you were 13 and you're still quite young now, you're 20. So you probably received all that, all that popularity at a young age. Or, and what are the misconceptions of being an influencer that most people don't see? So I kept it a secret for a while and I did a pretty good job at keeping a secret until about sophomore year. And so basically what happened is I told one buddy and I th- lesson is even if you just tell one person, everyone's probably going to find out one day. But being a, an influencer so young, I think it cre- creates like a false sense of popularity. Like you just, like people's attitude change towards you. It, it becomes less of like people actually getting to know you and liking you from the outside perspective of what you like what you could be and it created this world to myself a a big ego in a sense for a while and it in in its own way it created like and I'm grateful for that experience that it gave me because not only did it teach me that like my social media is not who I am and that's something I really had to get over but it also it put me down this path where i was so confident that social social media would be my life forever and growing accounts and being an influencer and all those things that i didn't go to things like i didn't do things like college and i didn't go to any school dances and i'm like grateful for all that but it, it pushed me away from i think the normal average life of a high schooler because i experienced it so young and i just had so many moving parts where i'd like miss school because i was like oh i gotta do a campaign for nike or in reality, it was just me posting something, but I would make it into this whole thing. And, and yeah, so I think that might answer your question, but people just generally are more like gravitated towards you because of what they see and they want a piece of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. I think it's totally natural. It's like, oh, ask for help if you can. And yeah, I think that's, and to be honest, I like, I, I just got to know who the real friends were really early and it made me just really good at realizing <laughs> how to mm. interact with people. Yeah. yeah. I forgot the second part to your question. I think that was answering the first part, which was, what was it like having an influencer status at a young age? And the second part would be, what are the misconceptions of being an influencer that most people don't see? I, people don't see how unstable it is for the most part and everyone assumes that if you're an influencer you're just going to make all this money all the time like you're going to get 
paid ad after paid ad after paid ad and that's it's not like that and i think if we talked about covid it'd be a great entryway to that but for the most part and you get taken advantage of a lot when you don't even know it because you just start you want any opportunity that comes your way especially when you're starting out and you want to say yes to everything because that's you're like okay this is oh cool nike wants to work with me but you just don't realize that you could be getting paid way more for those things and or i was gonna say the amount of ads you get are so sporadic like you could have a great month and you could be getting like you get like seven campaigns and then for the next six months you could have nothing i think that's mm. what people don't get is that it's not just like you get a hundred thousand followers and you're gonna always win like you're always searching for the next thing and i think the second part to that from the emotional and like mental health aspect of it is that you never learn to slow down because you always feel like you're 10 steps behind and mm -hmm. that's just how everyone makes you perceive it because you always just feel like you have to be doing more you have to be doing more you have to be getting on this app you have to be getting on that app and you have to be doing this and that and i think it just creates this like toxic mindset that it's never going to end and mm -hmm. uh, i've had this talk with a lot of influencers because like people who have 10 million followers on TikTok and a million followers on Instagram, like collectively, they come to me and they're just like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't enjoy this. And so I think people want to believe that it's all happy and everything like this. But I think the important part to understand is that it's actually draining most days. And mm -hmm. if you don't know how to handle that and you don't know how to go back to what we were saying at first, show up for yourself, then showing up for other people is going to be really hard. And so that's what a lot of people, especially people who realize it after they had like some spike in fame and they don't know what to do with it. That's what, that's the people that realize it quick. But like for me personally, I've gotten like this, like I'll fall off some months just to take like my own and I'm not there yet. I'm not totally there yet where I'm ready to fully grow my business for my personal photography so where I can be like, okay, I'm ready to show up for these people. Like I tried it, but for me, it's been like this gradual increase and decrease and increase and decrease until one day I'm like, okay, this is how I find that balance. But yeah. I, I, I can empathize with a little bit of it. We're not in completely the same space, but I have also have a uh, cafe restaurant um, called the Mayflower. And at the beginning we had the help of a PR company and a marketing company and we were able to blow it up very quickly and we had influencers help us out and we were doing shout outs and, and all these things. And we grew fairly quickly for a cafe restaurant base and we got into different publications and everything. And then you see this spike in customers coming in. And then after the honeymoon phase and then things start to slow down and you take that dip again. And in hospitality, you've got a staff for the amount of people that come in as well. So you've got to get in all these people yeah to help you out and then now it starts to slow down you got to let them go mm. and then you're like okay slow down what do we do now and we always have to constantly look for more material to post or a new menu item or something that would go something that people would want something a bit more viral so we have to find new content and post it out again and then that little spike again and it dips again and it's spike, and it's a constant search and it does get i can emphasize it does get quite tiring but it's the game that we play it's to keep in front of mind of yeah. people yeah, it's, it's, it's always, that's what motivates people. You get that 100 followers, you get that awesome brand deal, and then you're like, oh, it's like a taste of it's this dopamine rush. And you're like, oh, that's what it's about. That's what it feels like. And then the glory days aren't there. And that's when the real work comes in. Yeah, and yeah there's been some crazy days. For me, on the curation side, I remember I was like doing financially awesome and all these things. And then... I was like, oh, sweet, like life is good, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then I wake up one day and I have 150 emails of copyright strikes from one company dating all the way back to 2013. And this <sighs> company had bought viral videos and basically IP striked anyone who had the videos up and didn't get consent for them. And I was like 13 at the time posting the video. So I didn't think there was any harm in it. I was just like, oh, cool. Look at this funny video. Um, yeah, I wasn't direct profiting out of it. And I've been doing credit and consent since 2018. So it's been, I've been doing it for some while now, but still waking up and then them wanting to be like, hey, we're going to charge you 500 bucks per copyright strike. And that just hits like, you're like, oh. And so 
yeah. having to like swallow that and and i think that's what people don't see there's a lot of the lessons never stop mm. and, and yeah. yeah but yeah i feel that <laughs> the glory, <laughs> long glory days are tough <laughs> yeah yeah and i think speaking about instability before of the whole process I think it's a great segue into how COVID has come into effect. How has it affected your work since and how did you maneuver around it? When I got into, like when everything went down pretty much, I had just moved to Oregon and I was expecting to have this awesome experience of mountain biking and skiing and having an awesome season and all this and everything shut down. And then after that, all my work stuff was everyone was just scared to promote anything and like brands weren't working on anything. And I hadn't heard from anyone pretty much. And basically everything, even up to big dogs, like I remember Taco Bell was like canceling sponsored MBA stuff. And so I, I wasn't alone because there's a b- much bigger picture, but I wasn't getting any because, because the thing about freelance is you're not in like a salary and I hadn't any, I didn't have any other revenue streams at the time. And that's what kind of forced me like since then to get other revenue streams. And, but during that time, I didn't have practically any stability. And I was living in a $500 Airstream like per month. And basically, and that's around the same time I got all those copyright strikes. So my bank account got drained. And yeah, I was just trusting at that point I was trusting that things would go well and basically like worried that I wouldn't be able to afford anything and now I'm living in Jackson Hole which is probably the most expensive place ever to live in but it really showed me how to find stability during that if that makes sense Mm. it's just yeah I guess a story from COVID times is I was living in my $500 Airstream I was renting it from a dad's friend and I would have $1,000 in my bank account, rep con, like minus 500, have to pay for food and all these things. And uh, I'm like turning it in as I'm getting ready to move out. And I basically have 300 bucks in my bank account. And the guy mm-hmm. who I was renting from, he texts me and my dad and he goes, hey, there's a broken water pipe in here. And just to give you like some background, I wasn't even using the water in the airstream because it would just drain the battery and the shower water and like where you would go do your business was like in the same little like it it was a it was base camp i think airstream it's a little teardrop but it's mm. the shower and the, the toilet and the same thing and all of it would go to the same like waste compartment so if you took a shower your toilet's gonna fill up so, and i didn't even use it for that reason but he texted me, he's like, it's going to cost $300 to fix. I'm basically like, I'm going to be broke if I don't not pay this guy for something that's not my fault. And my dad, he was like, just send the guy's money and then things will work out. And I'm like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then <laughs> I'm like, okay, I sent it. I have 50 bucks in my bank account. And then like the next day I get hit up for a brand deal. So that's how it, <laughs> like, I, that. That's how the trust part of it plays in, I think, in my head. It's hard to not get to, like, trust the universe type thing, but that's how life works sometimes. Mm. And, I, yeah, I guess that's... And I, and I had to learn that from my dad, who was, like, a great teacher. Yeah. Uh, mm. He was living in Oregon at the time, and, um, yeah, taught me a lot. Talk about the universe delivering right at the last moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the story from uh, how my COVID experience went. But Yeah. And what tips do you have for people wanting to become influencers? I know that you also mentioned the mindset part, which I'd like to dive in a bit more after you share what you think. Yeah, so I really, I don't think people should be scared to dive into a space. And what comes with that is don't be afraid to ask for help. That was the biggest lesson my mom taught me when I was early, early, like growing up, like I would be going to Tony Robbins events and she would just be like, don't be afraid to ask. And but with that, I think to take into that is don't just ask without, don't mindlessly ask people like, hey, can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? Can you do this for me? You have to provide some value in a sense. Do your research on why you're reaching out to someone 
or a brand or maybe a company. And yeah, and and don't be afraid to just send that cold email or whatever it is. Because I think the best way someone can get started in a space like this is work with a company who's been doing it and then see what goes on behind the scenes or work with someone who's do, who does it, someone that you look up to maybe. Because I think that's a perfect, the perfect, the best way is like to find a mentor for the most part. And so I have a guy, um, Brandon, who's on my team for Best Celebrations, and he runs his own Instagram account. But basically, he's been interning for the past seven months. And I, we kept in touch and I reached out to him. Actually, <laughs> it was like reverse, but <laughs> I reached out to him. And for the most part, I check my messages all the time. So if someone reached out to me and was really like, I want to work for you type thing. And this is what I can provide. And this is the value I, I see. And this is where I could bring your company and stuff like that. I would most likely say yes. But Brendan was the first guy I had on my team. And he has learned so much. He's been a part of like Bud campaigns and music campaigns with big artists. And he just like his track record's building. And he's learning how to manage big pages and where to look for content. And he got like one of our posts on best celebrations reposted by Sports Center. And now Sports Center follows follows us. Like he has learned so much. And all because he just started working under me. And I think it's just a, w- a good way to fast track in that sense. And yeah. um, if, yeah. if it's from a creative perspective, I think get really, and you can start posting whatever you want beforehand. But I think if you really start like just going out and creating and getting better now, then you'll have confidence to jump into something and be like, wow, like I can start investing myself and putting budgets and like growing my social medias because that's really what it takes i take a a different approach on social media growth i'm not really like the i'm like i'm targeted growth for the most part so if i see something that can go viral i'm gonna pay people to give that reach because it's just getting really hard to just cross your fingers and hope something goes viral but if you can target that growth with good content it's like just guaranteed wins that's how um, that, that's the best way to, to mm. see it in my eyes. Yeah. I just want to quickly ask, you've mentioned some viral content a few times and you, you seem like a person that curates or creates viral content. What is for yourself? Is it simply an eye or a knack for things since that you've come across so much content or is there a bit of a breakdown that you think is viral content? Yeah, so yeah, part of that, if I'm looking for content, I'm looking for how many people shared it, how many people liked it, how many people retweeted it, how many people engaged with it, and it really just comes down to numbers in that sense, but there's certain ways we can maneuver and shift things around to make it appear more viral, and that's things like adding white borders and putting the text above it and things like that and memeing it is the best way to put it but yeah you can make anything viral i think that's what people (laughs) like if you have the distribution you can push anything and viral content is basically it's all bias (laughs) in my opinion it's the eye of whoever's looking at the content like you you thinking something could be viral could be totally different in my eyes and me thinking something that could be viral could be totally something different, but nobody's ever wrong in that sense. It just, but it does take a bit of just realizing. It's like if you if you go on your for you page on TikTok or whatever, and oh, you're just yeah. kind of getting a glimpse of that's why it's going viral. Yeah, I hope that. I hope that yeah, makes yeah. Sense. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of bias that comes into it, and from a creator standpoint, it's as a photographer, what I've noticed is just keep it simple. And I love this like minimalistic approach to things. And mm. it's funny because my, my, my views are shifting on that as well. If I like it, then why does it matter? And yeah. uh, that's what I take from most of my other photographers. And I heard a mm. great quote from uh, Chris Picard. He's uh, someone I look up to pretty heavily in the photography community. But he said, if you're just telling people what they can already see in the photo, like if you're like, oh, and I do this still because I just <laughs> I'd be like shades of blue, and yeah. if you're like oh, I can see shades of blue. But if you're not telling the story, then you're only 
doing them a disservice. And so I've been trying to do it more of like actually captivating them and like my Greenland experience and, and what I felt there. But yeah, that quote stuck with me and really sticks with me to this day. Thanks for sharing that. I mean, I really do appreciate it. Definitely mentally taking notes of everything at the moment. <laughs> Can't wait to yeah. review it all. Yeah. And I wanted to ask if you could share a little bit more about, say, we were talking about when influencers are getting this dopamine rush or what if they start to grow their followers and then things dip and then the whole mental side of thing. How do you maintain that, that sanity or that momentum or that motivation to keep going? Yeah, that consistency is hard, especially from a standpoint, if you're getting 200,000 likes consistently for a week and then suddenly the whole algorithm shifts and then you're getting 50,000, it can take a toll on your on your entire state. You can feel like you're failing and you can feel like you're not doing good enough, but for the most part, it's realizing that it's really not real at all. And that's, I think you can vouch for this too, is when your own practices and your own self-work comes into play meditation and going out and for a run or activities and stuff like that it's so important and people don't it's such a everyone talks about it go for a run go clean your room but you have to change that environment first before you can handle that heavy scale of depletion from the social side of stuff but most part it's not real and oftentimes you'll just keep eating away at you if it can if it keeps up if you take a second and step back that's when you can take it look at it from like an examined view and be like and, and and say okay this is what i need to change this is what i need to shift and stuff like that or else it's just gonna keep eating away at you and you're just gonna watch it go down or just not post it at, at all and yeah i think it's it's a hard eat for me, even days that it would eat away at me, for example, when I was going through a heavy heartbreak type thing, I didn't want to look at my phone, but somehow I would still find that strength in, in me. And maybe it just speaks for itself of like, some people just can do that. Some people can just show up no matter what day. And mm. I think I'm that type of person. And that may be what separates me from the rest of the group because I may not do it on my own personal photography stuff but we practically never miss a post on best celebrations mm -hmm. for more than a day and yeah i think it also just comes with personality yeah. Of, yeah. i wanted to further our previous question and ask how can businesses collaborate with influencers effectively to make an impact or what ways have you seen it happen that's a great question when i think about impact there's like a whole my, my mind kind of spins <laughs> my mind definitely pretty much spins because it can mean something completely different to everyone. But I'll use it from my own perspective. Yep. Of, uh, let's use like sustainability. And so first you got to see, and I, I assume if you're, a, if you're a business looking to collab with the influencer, first you got to see if that influencer aligns with you. And if you don't have that step done first, then you're, you're totally, because then it's just probably money driven from there. And if the influencer aligns with you, they're most likely going to be able to work with you better and say, so if a business reaches out to, I don't know, like, what's a good, I don't want to use, like Jason Derulo. I don't know if Jason Derulo is like sustainable or not. It probably isn't. But they reach out to him. They're like, hey, we have the, we're the sustainability company and we'd love to work with you. And we're all about helping the earth and saving the oceans and all this. And then Jason Derulo was like, oh, but my post rate is $60,000. And they're like, oh, we don't have enough money. We're just starting up. But you reach out to someone like me, who is an adventure photographer and cares about the environment and has seen glaciers melt in Greenland like live. There's a chance you're just going to get that post for free or just send them whatever you're working on and get them involved. I think the best type of promotion is one that's built off relationships rather than money driven. Uh, and that's just how I think all business should be for the most part. Think about relationships first and then money second. Yeah. Great tip. Yeah. Are there any key lessons you've learned from your journey so far that you'd like to share? Yeah, I would say the biggest one is just 
like we talked about before, take a step back and there's no rush, um, even though it may feel like it all the time. Second, that you always have the opportunity to become famous on Instagram or whatever you want to call it. There's always the opportunity. There's always ways to grow. There's always strategies out there. If you have the right budget, anyone can be famous for the most part and have a following. So there's no rush for that. I would say the third one is just start implementing practices into your daily life to enhance yourself. Um, so you can show better for other people. And just like we talked about before, like it's so simple, but you implement those and it's really powerful. So mm. I think I think the lessons or advice could get, go on and on and on based off the person. Yeah. But I think the biggest one I've learned is there's no rush and it doesn't hurt to smell the roses here and there. <laughs> yeah, understood, for sure. Yeah. Besides Instagram, what other platforms are you actively on or do you see opportunities in at the moment? Right now, I... So I've never been a fan of TikTok. I wasn't really, like, I'm like, okay, yeah, Clubhouse is cool. I love the idea of it, but I just don't want to like talk to people all day. I have things to do and it's cool. But right now, and I should have done this so long ago, but I'm just not getting the grasp of it. It's Twitter because the algorithm's still chronological for the most part. The reach is similar to Facebook because like you get shares and then it could blow up. And uh, yeah, and you can link directly link stuff so if you have a youtube video that comes out you can link that video pretty easily whether it's in the replies of a viral treat you had of just photos you can be like hey watch this youtube video and yeah the reach has just been phenomenal and the community that you build on there is unlike any other in my opinion because you can just have dialogue conversations you can just tweet your thoughts for the day you're like i just had cookie dough and then 50 people will like it and you're like cool everyone loves that I love cookie dough. There's just so much randomness that can go on in it. And I've, I felt myself more comfortable sharing my daily life on it as well. Because like on Instagram, I'm not really a story type of guy that talks to the camera or posts my adventures all the time. But on Twitter, I'm like, oh, here's what I did, guys. I just posted and tweeted and, tw and then people like it. I just feel like I'm creating a way more enhanced community on Twitter and yeah, I've had some, I've already had two tweets that have gotten two million impressions on it for my photography. Wow. And that was all just me targeting that too. I basically found pages to retweet it and spent like a hundred bucks for two million impressions. So I think there's a lot of power in it. And the fact that I could just drop my Instagram in the replies of that viral tweet that I made and get 400 followers from it is cool with me. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Definitely, definitely worth it. Yeah. Yeah, conversions are great. And I don't notice much conversions from an Instagram. If I'm like on Instagram, hey, everyone, follow my Twitter. Nobody's going to want to really take the time to get off hmm. Instagram to go to Twitter. But I've noticed it's great the other way around. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, that's just from my latest observations. I keep it pretty simple now. I don't really like to dabble in too many things because that's just a way to get yourself overwhelmed and just drained, just drained, mm -hmm. to be honest. I've tried TikTok and all these things, but if it doesn't align with you, there's no point in sticking with it. If you can feel like this isn't the thing for me and I'm doing this for all the wrong reasons, I think like, just don't do it. And that might be pretty like cold turkey, mm -hmm. but just from what I've noticed, I'd Back to that quote, it's, don't work hard to become someone you don't like. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're reaching the last quarter of the, the interview. And then there's a couple of questions that I'd like to ask and we can fire through them or not as, as quick or as slow as you like. <laughs> Do you have any morning or evening routines? Yeah, I've been doing cold showers, the Wim Hof method. Awesome. And as well as, uh, am I saying it right, Qi, Qigong? Um, yep, that's right. Yeah, so I've been doing some Qigong, and it's been pretty awesome. I've been feeling the effects of being able to move this energy throughout my body, mm. and that has been just magical on its own. As far as, I, I guess it's more of a life routine thing. I've, 
don't get freaked out when I say this right away because it's not what you guys think. But this routine of microdosing, and I take that in a sense of like 15 minute runs a day. So I saw this thing, it's like microdosing runs. So you do 15 minutes a day, and then over 30, 30 days, you put in so much, like I like 1.5 miles a day for 30 days. That adds up pretty fast. And mm. so I think like microdosing, and then like the actual dose is Grand Teton in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and doing a nine hour day in the mountains. And that's like the big day, and you do that like, twice a month. But I mm. think uh, it's like application of microdosing versus the big dose and then microdosing. Uh, big dose. See, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so hopefully you grasp, grasp that um, concept. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a good routine. It's, it happened just, just the other week. I was feeling pretty low emotionally and just drained and I didn't really want to talk to anyone I just felt like anxious and anxiety and honestly just like frustrated with how my body felt and it felt like no breathing practices were helping and no amount of qigong would help and so what do I do I'm like oh I haven't done any activity in a bit and so I just went on like a 10 minute run and then I got back and I felt like a completely different person I think the power of that speaks for itself <laughs> Yeah, change of state, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So do you have a favorite book that you'd recommend? The Alchemist. The Alchemist. This has been my favorite since high school. Yeah, it's such an amazing book. Are there any new beliefs or behaviors that have had a positive impact in your life in the recent years? Mm. Yeah, this might be a crazy one, but I think that time isn't real sometimes. But I also do. It's, you know what I mean? It's, I read this other book too. It's like thinking of time from like a geologist perspective. And so that kind of totally stripped away my belief that time is it real too. But yeah, I think the biggest belief I have is just do everything out of love and it'll come right back how it's supposed to. Mm. Yeah. And another one with that is don't get attached to the outcome. So just don't get attached on the outcome. If you're like, from a social media growth standpoint, you go, I need to grow 500,000 followers and then you don't grow 500,000 followers. You go, okay, yeah, I'm cool with that. Just don't get attached to the outcome. Or you have a big business call on Thursday and you're super anxious about it. You're just like, I'm, what if I don't get this job? Just don't get attached to the outcome and mm. everything will be fine. And so that might have its Zen state in my opinion, and just living in flow. But mm. yeah, a lot of things I are subconscious at this point, and maybe I, I can answer that question better when I'm skiing or something. No, that's all good. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> if you could only send one single line of SMS text to yourself five years ago, what would it be? I keep repeating the same thing, but I would say there's no rush. Yeah, I'd say there's mm. no rush. Yeah. Man, it's it's been so good connecting with you. How could people reach out or learn more about you? One thing I want to add. I think another text I would send. Yeah, sure. Would be, you're going to have an awesome mustache five near, five years from now. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, pretty simple. If you want to connect, just hit me up on Wave, at Wave on Instagram not really complicated of a username you might have to scroll down a bit in the search bar to find me but the dude with long hair smiling and <laughs> yeah all my other social media accounts are attached to that and yeah for the most part that's how you'd find me now quinn thanks so much for taking the time today uh, i really appreciate all the tips and the stories that you shared it is definitely of value and we are living in that influencer age still mm -hmm. and there are lots of people who are either in it or looking forward to being in that space and i really appreciate that you've shared your wisdom and your tips thank you so much for buddy thanks Kevin. thanks for tuning in everyone i hope you enjoyed the show all the links to the show notes will be available at kevinleysocial.com spelled k-e-v-i-n-l-y Conversely, if you have any interviews that you'd love to recommend, please send it over to kevinleesocial at gmail.com. I'd love to connect. Thank you. Until the next episode.